Guys, we're not done talking about the column yet. We're almost there, but we're not quite there yet. Uh, and, and that's before we go off to our next piece. So we're definitely not done talking about the instrument yet. So that means you got a tons of more videos. I hope you're ready. Okay, so these problems that we're going to see with columns, uh, they're going to be kind of common. Uh, these are going to be things that's going to happen to you at one day or another. They're going to happen. Uh, and what you need to understand is that IC can be very temperamental. So what I mean by that is that some days you're going to go in and it's going to work great, and other days you're going to go in and it seems like the machine's getting ready to fall apart. Uh, that's just the way it is. That's the way all liquid chromatography systems are. They're just temperamental things that you're just going to have to deal with on a daily basis. And it is what it is, and you just need to fix it, and you just need to move on. But that's the nature of liquid chromatography as a whole. It's not an instrumentation manufacturer's problem. It's not because someone doesn't know how to use it. It's just because that is how it goes sometimes. Whether you keep it super clean and super maintained and preventive maintenance on it, it's going to crap out one day. And that's just how it is. All right. One of the things that uh, a lot of people don't want to hear is that if you want to prevent some of these problems from happening, the IC can be temperamental and the columns are going to be temperamental too. And the columns are really going to do your separation. And let's say I run in one day and I run a sample that I ran yesterday. And then all of a sudden, my retention times are not going to match up. Uh, there's an issue here, right? I can't go any further because I need to make sure that I'm going to get the same retention times that I always have. And this column could be degrading. And if I have a sucky little column that's not going to be doing my separation anymore, then I'm going to have to figure out how to replace it or I'm going to have to figure out how to prevent this from happening in the future. One of the ways that you can do this is always use the same mobile phase on that particular column. Meaning, do not, if you can help it, install a column and have mobile phase A running through it. And then on the same day, keep the column in place, switch out, to mobile phase B, which is different, and run mobile phase through it. And then at the end of the day, put mobile phase A back on the system and run mobile phase through it. Okay, that's bad. The column can handle it. The packing material can handle it. The issue, though, is that you can start to cause contamination issues and these mobile phases might not completely flush out, and these mobile phases might actually start reacting together, and you start to see a degrade in your column. So just don't take the risk in doing this type of thing. It's always best to use the same mobile phase from beginning to the final use of the column. So have something that's kind of dedicated, right? If I'm in the laboratory and I have a type of sample Let's say that this is going to be drinking water, and I'm analyzing that sample on an IC instrument. Always dedicate that instrument to the drinking water samples. That way, up here at the top, you've got the same mobile phase that's getting used for that system. And then let's say that that same laboratory is analyzing something completely different. It's not drinking water anymore, but it could be some other kind of crazy stuff. Let's say this is antifreeze. What on earth? I don't want to use the same system. It's a different type of sample. I'm looking for different things, and it might require a different mobile phase up here at the top. So have a dedicated instrument just for that. I know that's going to run into money, right? Companies will not want to hear this at all. But listen, folks, if you are taking the time to take the mobile phase off, put new mobile phase on. That requires an equilibration for at least 30 minutes to an hour before you get to run samples on it. And then you go and run samples with the new mobile phase that was installed. 
and then someone else has to come behind you and take that mobile phase off and put new mobile phase back on and equilibrate it for 30 minutes to an hour, you've just lost two hours of production time. Two hours of production time times five is 10 hours of production time that you're losing where samples could be running. And 10 hours of production time, that's more than one day of work on an eight-hour shift. And if these samples are 30 minutes each, then I could process 20 more samples at least if I'm not switching mobile phases all over the place. And let's say that the company charges, I don't know, $100 for each test. Well, 20 times 100, that's $2,000 extra that the company can make per week. All right. $2,000 extra per week times four is $8,000 for a month. And then you times that by two, that's $16,000. So in two months time, the company could make enough money to purchase another IC system and now they can double duty. They can process more samples throughout the day. There's not a downtime. There's not equilibration factors to turn in. And more importantly, they're not destroying the $2,000 or $3,000 columns that they have to put on the inside of the machine. That is something that you got to keep in mind. And you got to talk numbers to companies sometimes for them to get the picture. Because if not, they're just going to see that price tag of a new instrument and they're going to say absolutely not. So keep that in mind. The columns can also get destroyed. Keep those as long as you can. And it's always best to pump the same type of mobile phase through when you can. Don't switch them up. All right. Now. Let's talk about other ways that we can take care of the column. What most people get surprised with is that some will want you to store these columns in the refrigerator. So your question is, ah, they're polymers, so they're kind of plasticky in a way. It's organic benzene and divinyl benzene styrene. Uh, the surface of them are just ammoniums and sulfonates. So why do we got to keep them in the fridge? Okay, so here's the issue with this. We don't keep ours in the fridge. Some people do not keep them in the fridge. But some people insist on keeping them in there especially for long periods of time. And the reason is because depending on your sample, the sample is going to make it into the column. Let's say that this was a soda sample. That soda sample's got tons of stuff, right? That soda sample can get inside of this column, and that soda sample can go out the column, but maybe some can be left behind. Let's say that I'm working in another food lab, and let's say I'm processing lettuce, or let's say I'm processing pepperoni, and I'm looking at the nitrates or the nitrites in those foodstuffs, and I'm pumping all of this sludge through the IC column. You can imagine, especially if it's like pepperoni, all the grease and nastiness that's coming along with it. The lettuce, well, let's say that this was out in the field. How many times have you heard about E. coli and stuff on lettuce and spinach getting recalled? Well, this is a source of bacteria. It's a source of microorganisms. So when I say stuff gets left behind, a part of that that might get left behind is a microorganism that can be left behind. And then they can get in here and they can multiply and they can have little families, enjoy Christmas together, and they will just keep multiplying over and over and over and over, and then you're going to have a column full of microorganisms, not full of stationary phase. And all of this is due to your samples that you're injecting on them. So, number one, if we put them in the refrigerator, we can slow the growth. Maybe they won't multiply. That's one of the things that we're looking for. You also need to clean them. 
before you store them, however you decide to store them, whether it's in the refrigerator or whether it's in a drawer, it doesn't really matter, depending on the type of sample you're running. But let's say that we take the column off. What should we do before we take the column off? If you know that you're finished with it, if you know you don't need to use that particular column anytime soon, what they will encourage you to do is to pump NaOH through the column at a 100 millimolar strength. And this is going to be at a very slow flow rate. So you're allowing all of the alkali to kind of seep in this column. And you know, a lot of times they're coming from the bottom and out the top. So I constantly make that mistake. But this NaOH is constantly going to be slowly pushed through the column at a hundred millimolar. And it's going to go out the other end. That alkali, that higher pH level, uh, that can kill a lot of this stuff out. That can also flush out the column extremely well. It can dislodge, uh, dislodge a lot of the particles uh, that might still have component or sample analytes on it, uh, especially if things are attached to those particles kind of stubbornly. So this 100 millimolar NaOH solution can do a very good job of cleaning out the column. So that's kind of number one. Okay. Uh, number two, you always then want to rinse it with water if you're done. So after you pump this NaOH mobile phase through the system, then take that jug off and then put another jug of just DI water on it. That's all that you got to do. And then turn the pump back on and allow a whole pump or a whole bottle full of DI water to flush through that column. And that will help get the NaOH out of there. It will help rinse everything out of the column that needs to go away. It's going to be quite a bit of water that gets pumped through. Not a big deal. But that's always going to be the proper washing and the proper rinse. So this is my wash step. And this is my rinse step. Now, if you know the column is going to be used tomorrow, you don't need to do this with it. Right? But if you know that this particular column is not going to be used in like a week or three weeks, then you probably need to go ahead and you need to wash it, you need to rinse it, you need to kind of take care of it, so that way you're not slowly destroying the column over time. If you do not do these steps, I'm not saying that the column won't work. Quite honestly, we've had columns on our machine before, and they'll sit there for six months. And we'll go through, and we'll turn them on, and they work just like they always have. But we always carry the chance of getting a bad column because of that step. We ignore it. And these bad columns, you'll know that you're going to get. They have very bad separations, or they'll start to show bad separations. If we were working in a regulated lab our retention time shifts would not fly. But we kind of go with the flow. If we start to get a bad column, we just accept that fact, and we accept the new retention time, and we just go on about our business. But sometimes that wouldn't work in a company, an environmental lab, a pharmaceutical lab. They would say, absolutely not. we got to figure out what the problem is. They also show broader peaks. Uh, we're okay with fat peaks sometimes right? Uh, we don't run complicated samples. Uh, we have very limited samples that we run, and they're pretty simple. That way you get the idea and the technique behind it, but we're not overloading you with information, hopefully. Well, these broader peaks aren't going to cause us a problem, because if we're working very simple that have very limited number of things on the inside of them, then our peaks can get a little fatter and we don't have to worry about the resolution. That's all right. Not a big deal there. We're not overlapping anything. Retention time I'm going to put on the list. I've already talked about this, really. That kind of relates to the bad separation. And then a bad column can also show us uh, kind of wonky, is what I'm going to say, 
calibration curves. Uh, maybe you made everything the proper way. You did what you were supposed to do. Not a big issue there at all. Everything was prepared. Every volumetric flask was up to the line. Your pipettes were up to the line. Good job for you. But when you run samples, well, the peak is going to be a little ugly, a little lopsided. Maybe it doesn't go back down to baseline. Something's going to happen in that column, and your area is going to be off. And because that area is off, your calibration curve is going to be off too. That's not your fault. That could be the machine's fault. And if it is the machine's fault, it's relying on the data that's coming from the column. So that column is starting to degrade or decompose over time. Right? To prevent some of this stuff from happening, and maybe you don't want to take the time to wash and rinse and store them in a refrigerator, some people will use what we call a pre-column. A pre-column is also called a guard column. And that guard column is typically attached to the main column. And as the sample goes in and the sample comes out, it goes through the guard column first. This guard column is the same stationary phase. We've talked about this before. The same stationary phase that your main column is here. But if something sludgy and nasty and dirty gets into the system, then it can go through the guard column first and mess this one up before it goes into your column, your main column here, which is, of course, way more expensive. What do these guard columns look like? Uh, they're like little miniature columns. Think of tea party columns. And this is what you're going to see with them. So these are tiny little miniature columns. Uh, what you're seeing over here is if you look at the tag, it's going to say MetroCEP C4. Uh, this C4 number is going to be a matching column number. There's a column that's probably regarded as C4. And this says guard here at the very end. So this lets you know that on the inside of this, there's a small amount of stationary phase. That small amount of stationary phase is going to be kind of matching your main column in the very end and notice it sees you can see the flow the arrows are pointed in this direction so your sample will come in this way and it will go through the guard and it will go out the other end and this will make it to the column that's going to be attached on the other side okay uh, this is a little different than a pre-filter we've talked about inline filters right and the inline filter looks pretty similar here and uh, that inline filter just has a piece of filter paper that's going to be right here, and that's about it. Uh, there's no stationary phases in those. Those two pieces just kind of unscrew. There's a piece of filter paper on the inside, like a membrane filter, and you can take that out and exchange it with a new one and then screw the two pieces back. That is not the same as a guard column. A guard column is supposed to have the stationary phase on the inside that will help prevent some of this crap from coming through and going into your main column over here on the other side. Uh, also note that this guard column, if you are using it, this is space, right? And that space can affect retention time because there's void volume here as well, right? And this is extra time and extra length that your sample has to travel through to go out the other end. So if you're running a system with a sample on a column that has no guard, the retention time will come out much smaller. If you run a system and a sample with a guard column, then your retention time will actually go up. So that's the reason it's got stationary phase in it. It's a little bit of extra length. The retention time is going to be affected just a little bit, not by much, but a little bit, it's going to go up. It's going to take longer for that sample to travel through because it's got to travel through your guard and your column now, not just your column. So those are some of the things that you got to think of uh, when you begin to uh, incorporate guards. And let's say that you go in one day and you tell somebody, hey, we need to put a guard on here because we've not used a guard on it. What are you thinking? And you put a guard on it and then the retention times all change up. 
That's one of the reasons. That's extra space, extra stationary phase the sample's going through. So there's a picture of the guard column. Uh, we do have guard columns on our IC systems. A lot of people have this idea that, especially the way that I've drawn this here, is that is a piece of tubing that will screw onto this end and it will go into the column here. And sometimes that is the case, depending on the manufacturer that you've got. Uh, other times, this piece can just really screw directly into the column. Uh, so you don't need an extra piece of tubing that connects the two here. That really just depends on the instrumentation manufacturer. And if you take a look at our Metrome systems, you're going to see those guards basically directly screwed in to the major column that's going to be there. All right, so uh, that's all of my notes about the column. So what I'm going to show you in the next couple of videos are the uh, Metrome videos that they have done uh, to show you the area of the column, maybe how to change out the column and so forth. So that's what you're going to see in the next upcoming videos, uh, kind of like some of those other videos that you've saw before already. Uh, and that's where we're going to pick up in the next one.